Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, today we start a new topic, which is optics, classical optics and geometrical optics. Optics is a science that deals with light. Everything related to light. Light emission, light propagation, interaction of light with matter, and uh, detection of light. So if we talk about the sources of light, uh, all the sources of light can be uh, divided into two large groups. The first group is the natural sources of light. And uh, among the most important natural sources of light is our sun, the closest star. The sun is the source of light and heat energy on the planet. Also other stars can be seen at night. It means that uh, hundreds and thousands of stars that can be seen with naked eye are uh, emitting light. And this light is sometimes is used, uh, utilized in some uh, experiments with light. The light from distant stars. Uh, the number of stars in the galaxy is actually much larger than we can see with naked eye. The number of stars in the galaxy is about 100 billion. And what we can see is just a small portion, no more than a few thousands. Uh, among the natural sources of light, uh, we can mention lightning. Lightning is also a natural source of light, but to use this source of light is inconvenient because one never knows when the lightning will come, at what time and in what place. Uh, so this is a random source of light. If we talk about the artificial sources of light, uh, man has created a lot of them. The first is a candle, which we can light a small fire on the end of the candle, and that was probably the first artificial source of light, uh, a part of, apart from fire in the fireplace. And uh, also we have a light bulb, electric bulb, which uh, radiates light because of a uh, high temperature of its filament and also we have some semiconductor sources of light like uh, light emit emitting diodes and also we have lasers lasers nowadays are very important artificial sources of light which are used in many many experiments with with light uh, so the light can be obtained in different situations using different sources and how do we detect light we have a very good uh, detector of light that is a natural organ which is given to us a human eye a, an eye is very good is very sensible detector capable of uh, detecting very small light intensities and also uh, human eye is very sensitive as far as the light color is concerned a human eye is capable of detecting and distinguishing between a uh, great lot of colors sometimes located very close to one another so human eye is a unique device with which we can observe light also, there are some artificial detectors of light, like photodetectors and uh, photographic plates covered with photosensitive material and uh, some, uh, some other devices which were uh, invented to measure uh, single light quanta, single quanta of light. As far as the properties of light are concerned, one should say that uh, light is a, an electromagnetic radiation. It's an electromagnetic wave. And uh, to discuss this issue, I will 
draw a line to show different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and let this be for example one nanometer and this will be one micron and that will be one millimeter and that will be one meter and that will be 1,000 meters, one kilometer. So along this line, I have shown different wavelengths uh, in logarithmic scale. Each new point on this line is, uh, refers to a wavelength 1,000 times larger than the previous point. One meter is 1,000 times larger than one millimeter, and one millimeter is 1,000 times larger than one micron. And so one nanometer is certainly 10 to the power of nine meter, and this is 10 to the power of minus six meter, and that is 10 to the power of minus three meters, and that is 1,000 meters. So if we talk about electromagnetic radiation, it covers all this, all this possible wavelengths. If we consider a radiation with a kilometer wavelength, then uh, this radio, radio waves, this radiation is used for long distance communication. If we talk about hundreds of meters and meters wavelengths, then this is a radiation for different radio stations. In, uh, including frequency modulated signals. If we talk about uh, millimeter and centimeter radiation, this is uh, radiation used in many de devices, uh, like in decimeter, decimeter uh, range, um, like microwave uh, oven, which is used in kitchens. A microwave is, belongs to this region. And also centimeter uh, range and decimeter range is uh, the range of radiation used in radio location and radio location. And here we come to a uh, less than one millimeter waves. This is an infrared radiation, infrared radiation emitted by heated objects. And then we come closer to one micron and here we find the optical range, the optical range of radiation that is the optical range of wavelengths, which range from about 0. Uh, which ra range about 0. 0.4 up to 0. 0.76 microns. That is about 400 nanometers up to uh, 706. 60 nanometers. That's a short range of wavelengths which constitutes a visible light. What we can see with our eyes is the radiation having this wavelength in this region. That, that is the range of wavelengths of visible light. If we go further to a short wavelength, we find uh, ultraviolet radiation and X radiation, <coughs> X ray, X rays. So in this visible uh, visible range of light, uh, the largest wavelength belongs to a red line. We, can, we, we perceive this radiation as a red line and then goes yellow, green and blue and dark blue and violet radiation and this is ultraviolet radiation on this same, on this part. <clears throat> so the light radiation is a radio frequency, is the radio radio waves, electromagnetic waves with, uh, with such a small wavelength. So these are the wavelengths for visible light. Uh, very important property of light is its velocity of propagation in vacuum or speed of light. The speed of light is usually denoted by letter C and it's about 300,000 kilometers per second. About 300,000 uh, kilometers per second. That is the speed of light. There is a very simple connection between the wavelength and the frequency 
and the speed of light. So uh, the frequency is the number of wavelengths which go in one second if the light propagates in vacuum. From this relationship, we can easily obtain the frequency of any electromagnetic radiation if we know the speed of propagation in vacuum and the wavelength. And as far as the light is concerned, we will find the frequency of light waves as uh, 3 times 10 to the five sp fifth power kilometers. And I would like to use meters in uh, international system. So the number of kilometers must be multiplied by 1000, 10 uh, to the third power. And that will be meters per second, meters per second. And also I will divide it by some, uh, uh, also I will divide it by some um, wavelength, like let, let it take 0 0.6, 0 0.6, somewhere in the middle of this interval, 0 0.6 microns. Micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters. So meters will cancel here, and what we have, 3 divided by 0 0.6, that's about 5. And then we have 10 to the power of 8 plus 6. That will give us about 5 to the power of 8 uh, by, by, by 8, 5 times 8 to the power of 14. That is uh, 1 divided by second, that is hertz. So, um, what it means, it's uh, about uh, 500 terahertz, a huge frequency. Uh, that is the frequency of uh, the frequency of visible light uh, radiation. About something about this, some red uh, red light will red color light will be, will have slightly smaller frequency because the wavelengths will be slightly larger, and. Uh, uh, green and blue and violet radiation will have slightly larger frequency because the wavelengths will be slightly smaller. But that is a characteristic frequency of visible light radiation, about 500 terahertz. terahertz. That is, the frequency is about 510 to the 12th, 12th power of hertz. That's the most characteristic frequency of visible light. Uh, now we will consider some properties of light. And the first and the simplest property is uh, the rectilinear propagation of light. If you have a small ray of light, a small ray of light, it propagates along the straight line. And so a small ray can be obtained by allowing the light to pass through a small pinhole. And if we have here some source of light, some source of light, then behind this or wall with a small pinhole, we will have a light ray, and that ray will propagate along the straight line. That is a rectilinear propagation. Rectilinear, rectilinear propagation of light rays. That is very important and one of the simplest properties of light. Also, it's very easy to see the rectilinear propagation, propagation along the straight line. If you have a small laser, a small laser will, any, any laser will give you a very pointed uh, ray of light, which obviously propagates along the straight line. And the light ray can be seen if it's, if it's dispersed by some, in some dispersive, if it's uh, 
uh, if there is if there are some dispersive particles here like a uh, uh, smoke like a smoke then in the smoke the light will be uh, uh, the light ray can be visible if if the space is absolutely empty absolutely nothing there then you will not see the light ray inside the empty space in order to see the light ray you must have you must have some <coughs> small particles here which will be illuminated by light uh, and which will be visible in the light ray when they are illuminated is it property is this property of rectilinear propagation a uh, universal and absolutely applicable applicable in any situation no certainly not sometimes the uh, rectilinear propagation of light is violated the most simple case when it's violated is when we have a diffraction of light a diffraction of light on the edge of this pinhole uh, or on the on some objects like this screen a diffraction of light causes the light waves to propagate not rectilinearly but in some more complicated fashion the diffraction of light will be will look something like that the, the light propagating when it's diffracting uh, but in many cases the diffraction can be neglected that is uh, the case when the wavelength is much smaller than the dimension of the pinhole through which the light passes or when the light when the wavelength is much smaller than other dimensions here which are important for uh, propagation of light so if we have small wavelengths then the phenomenon of diffraction is negligible and then and only in this case the propagation of light is rectilinear also there are some other situations when rectilinear propagation is violated by something for example r recti r rectilinear propagation will be violated will be the light will be distorted near a gravitating body for example if you have a sun somewhere here if you have a sun and this is the light coming from a li from a distant star and this is the sun our sun then the light rays coming near the sun will be will not go along the straight line but they will somehow be uh, distracted <coughs> deflected but this angle is very small because the sun has small gr uh, gravitation field uh, if we take some more uh, strong uh, stronger gravitation field of heavier bodies uh, then then the deflection of light rays will be larger so the rectilinear propagation will will be uh, will not be uh, will not apply if the light train goes near the gravitating body but this is a exotic situation which is observed somewhere in outer space and you must apply special tools to observe this phenomenon and in our everyday life in our everyday life uh, this uh, deflection of right, light waves in gravitational field uh, can be neglected it's very small it's negligible also <coughs> we neglect uh, diffraction in the field of geometrical optics this uh, condition is the condition of uh, application of geometrical optics uh, the rules of geometrical optics the wavelengths must be much smaller than uh, the dimension of all other objects with which light is uh, interfering the dimension like the diameter of the pinhole through which the light is propagating so this is the general condition for applicability of geometrical optics if this condition is violated then you will have no right to apply the rules of geometrical optics if this condition is violated then you will have to use the rule rules of wave optics and wave wave optics and wave propagation is described 
in general case by Maxwell's equations, uh, by wave equation, which is a consequence of Maxwell's equations. And that is more complicated case, actually. So we start from geometrical optics. We neglect the wavelength. So sometimes, even in geometrical optics, uh, the fact that, the, uh, that there is some wavelength is important. The fact that uh, light radiation has some wave properties will be important even in geometrical optics in some certain uh, situations. Uh, the second property of light, which we will consider apart from rectilinear uh, propagation of light rays, the second property will be reflection of light. So suppose we have a light ray which falls on the surface of some uh, body, on the smooth surface, <clears throat> then this light ray will be reflected from the smooth surface. This is a reflection. Reflection of light. There is a simple law of reflection. If you draw a perpendicular to the surface, a normal line, uh, then uh, the reflection takes place in such a way that the reflected beam of light or reflected ray and the falling incident ray lie in the same plane with the normal. The, these three lines, the incident ray and the normal to the surface and the reflected ray, all these three lines belong to the same plane. That is the first important thing. And the second important thing here is that the in angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So this is the angle of incidence and this is the angle of uh, reflection, say so. So these two angles are equal. If we observe reflection from a plane mirror or plane surface, which is very smooth. If the surface is not very smooth, if it has some roughness on its surface, uh, some rough, uh, rough surface, then the light will not be reflected according to this law. Then the light will be scattered. Uh, any light ray will be scattered in all possible directions. And the scattering will take place, it will have some diagram of energy distribution, and the scattering will take place in each point of this surface. That's the way all the usual subjects uh, about around us, uh, uh, all the usual subjects um, reflect light. They scatter light. A piece of paper, any piece of paper you take is scattering light in all the directions. Um, at whatever angle you look at it, you always see the white sheet of paper because it scatters light in each point of it scatters light in all the directions because it's not a, a very smooth surface it, it has some roughness and the roughness is on the the dimension of this roughness is of the order of magnitude of the wavelength uh, lambda of the incident uh, light so if the roughness if the dimension of this uh, roughness is of the order of lambda, then you will have a scattering surface. But if the roughness, which is always there, it's impossible to produce absolutely smooth surface. It must, it will always be a little bit rough. Uh, at least on the atomic scale, there are atoms here, atoms are molecules. So at least on the atomic scale, it will not be very smooth, it will have some roughness. So, but if the dimension of this roughness is smaller than lambda, much smaller, then this surface will, be, will act like a mirror with uh, perfect reflection. Uh, if you take a substance uh, which is transparent, like a piece of glass, for example, this is a piece of glass. 
this is a this is a glass plate this is a glass plate then only part of the incident light will be reflected another part will be will go somehow into the glass and that will be the angle of refraction let it be i1 and that will be i2 the angle of refraction so this light is called refracted refracted refraction this is the phenomenon of refraction and this light ray is called a refracted light in contrast in contrast to the reflected beam of light this is reflected and this is refracted beam of light uh, the angle of refraction i2 depends on the properties of this uh, transparent medium and when this light beam will go out it will again be refracted at the interface between the two mediums between the two media the glass for example and air if the light beam goes out of the glass it again will be refracted and the angle here will again be i1 and that will be angle i2 so refraction on the surface of a transparent medium takes place uh, depending on which medium is uh, has more density more optical density if if this is a glass then and the, and the light beam goes from the air then the, the refracted light will somehow be bent toward the normal if the light beam goes from the glass into the air then the refracted light will go away from the normal to the surface <clears throat> and there is a simple law which governs this, which uh, describes this phenomenon. And the law is called the Snell's law. The Snell's law uses the uh, refraction index of medium, the refraction index N of any, any transparent medium has its own refraction index, which is defined the refraction index is defined as the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in medium. In this medium, the speed of light is smaller than in vacuum. That is an experimental fact. The speed of light can be measured in the medium and it can, it's much smaller. Sometimes it's 50% smaller, sometimes it's twice uh, smaller, two times smaller. So depending on, on the medium, but usually uh, the speed of light is smaller, a few percent smaller than in vacuum. So N uh, refraction index uh, varies from 1 to 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.5. And in very exotic cases, it goes higher to 2 or more than 2. Actually, it's about 1.5 or less. So this is the just... Uh, uh, just saying the what will be the speed of light in the medium and the Snell's law uh, can, is connecting the uh, phenomenon of reflect, refraction with the speed of light in this medium and uh, so if uh, suppose the speed of light here in is uh, this is a vacuum and speed of light here is C and speed of light here is much smaller, speed of light here is V. Then there is a simple law, uh, Snell's law, which says that sine of the angle of incidence I1 divided by sine of the angle of refraction I2 equals N. That is the simplest way, the simplest, uh, the simplest 
version of, of the Snell's law. Now we will uh, derive this law. We will derive this law from some theoretical considerations. Uh, let us consider an interface between two uh, parts of the space. And the first part will have a refraction index n1, and the second part will have a refraction index n2. And so let a light ray fall on the interface. There will certainly be some reflected beam of light. I will not consider it now. I will consider only the refracted beam of light. And now we remember that light is an electromagnetic wave propagating in space. And the electromagnetic wave has some wavelengths and it's propagating uh, very much like a wave on the surface of water. You can well imagine a wave on the surface of water. Uh, so practically the same happens in the space. Or you may imagine a wave uh, of a sound wave propagating in, in air. Uh, so there is a wave front. If we have a beam of light and we consider a wavelength, then we, it means that we don't neglect the wavelength. And we consider a um, small, narrow beam of light we consider it in detail, uh, trying to understand what happens there on uh, the language of wavelengths. So we, we consider this uh, beam of light as if it were a thick beam of light. That is uh, the whole space filled with this plane wave. And the plane wave must have a wave front which is perpendicular to the wave propagation, and wave propagation is the light beam. So this is a right angle, and this is the wave front, and the wave front propagates in space with the velocity of light, and at some moment of time the wave front will be here. And uh, this point will propagate further and reach the interface between two surf between two. Uh, two media during uh, some time interval. And if this distance is delta x, then it will be equal to the velocity of light v1 in the first medium times delta t, a time interval needed for, for the light wave to propagate uh, on this to propagate to this distance delta x. What happens at the same time with this light wave which goes into the medium? Here we use a principle of Huygens-Fresnel, a Huygens-Fresnel principle which says that every point of wave front is the point of secondary waves. So when the disturbance uh, in space, electromagnetic disturbance, electromagnetic wave comes to this point. This point becomes the source of secondary waves. It radiates secondary waves, which propagate at some velocity v2 in this medium, which is, by the way, by definition, is the velocity of uh, light in vacuum divided by the refractive index of this, of this medium. So we have the medium with refractive index n1 and the medium with refractive index n2. And the velocity of light here differs from the velocity of light in the upper part of this space. So here the light wave will propagate with different velocity. It means that when the light comes to this point here, inside the medium it will come to some, it will go to some, uh, at some different distance. So that's a light front inside the medium will form uh, at some different angle. And that will be the distance propagated by light wave from this point to this point 
during time interval delta t. And this distance will be, for example, uh, let it be delta x1 and that will be delta x2. That will be, again, the velocity of light v2 in the second medium times delta t, where delta t is the same time interval. So during the same time interval delta t, the light propagating in the first medium will go to distance delta x1. And the same light wave propagating in the second medium will go at a different distance delta x2 because the velocity of propagation here is different. So, uh, the wave front in, in the second medium will be somewhat uh, turned by some angle with respect to the wave front in the first medium. So, the wave front has some different direction. And therefore, the light beam or the light ray in the second medium will have different direction because the light uh, the propagation, the direction of propagation, which is indicated by the light ray, is always perpendicular to the wave front. It's perpendicular to the wave front. If the angle of incidence here is I1, then this I1 angle is this one. Because, because the light ray is perpendicular to the wave front, and this is, by definition, is the normal to, uh, to the interface between the two parts of space, between the two mediums. And so these two angles are equal, equal to I1. Also, also this angle here, the angle of reflection I2, will equal to this angle. This is also I2, this one. And if we consider the sine of I1, then the sine of I1 will be delta x by definition of sine. The opposite leg in the right triangle, this is the right angle, the opposite leg must be divided by this hypotenuse which I will denote by A, for example. This hypotenuse is A. And uh, the sine of the angle of refraction of this angle here, which equals to this angle, will be equal to, according to the same definition, uh, the ratio of the opposite leg, which is delta x to to the same hypoten hypotenuse A. So this is delta x1, certainly. If we divide one equation by another, we obtain sine angle of incidence divided by sine angle of refraction equal to delta x1 divided by delta x2 and uh, Hypotenuse A will cancel here. Now we recall what is delta x1 and delta x2. We substitute this expression here and we obtain V1 delta t. And for delta x2, we substitute this expression here and we obtain V2 delta t. Delta t will cancel and we obtain V1 divided by V2, the relationship between the velocities of light in, in the two medium, and uh, in the two media. And uh, so the velocity of light in the first medium is equal to the velocity of light here equals to C divided by the refraction index N1 of the first medium. So instead of the velocity V1, I use this expression C divided by V by, by N1. C divided by the refraction index of the first medium. And instead of the velocity V2, I will put C divided by the refraction index of the second 
uh, medium. So we obtain N2 divided by N1. So if we combine the initial formula, the initial expression, with the final expression, then we obtain the Snell's law, which in the simple form was written here. I told you that this formula is, uh, uh, is valid for the case when the upper side, the upper medium is air or vacuum, which has a refraction index equal to unity. And now we have calculated all this, uh, all everything which happens here, taking into account two different refraction media, uh, two different uh, refraction ind indexes of these two parts of space. And we obtain the same, uh, we obtain the Snell's law in the most general form, sine 1 by sine i2 equals n2, the refraction index of the second medium, divided by n1, the refraction medium of the first medium, the refraction index of the first medium. If n1 equals unity, then you will have just the refraction index of the second medium, which is written here. So this is the most general form of the Snell's law, which we have derived based on the wave properties of light. We assumed that there is a wave front, wave front, and we took into account and made use of the Huygens Fresnel principle, which says that every point of the wave front is the source of secondary waves, and secondary waves propagate uh, are spherical waves and they propagate in the second medium and as every point of this interface is the source of secondary waves all the secondary waves interfere with each other and all the spherical waves interfere with each other and the result of interference is the wave front of the light beam this is the result of interference of many, many spherical waves originating from all the points uh, located on the interface between the two medium. So this is the Snell's law. And now we consider some interesting things which are related to the Snell's law, related to refraction. Uh, let's consider some medium and the normal. This is the normal to the medium. And uh, we allow for the light beam to go upward in the upward direction from the medium, from, this, uh, from the glass plate, for example, into the air. So it goes from the glass plate at some angle a alpha to the air, and there it will be some larger angle beta. Beta is always larger than alpha because the refractive index n here is larger than unity, and here the refractive index is unity, if this is vacuum or if this is air. And this is a glass plate, a glass plate. So if the light beam goes from, uh, from the glass plate out into the air, then this angle beta will be larger than alpha. What happens if we increase the angle alpha step by step and send the rays at larger and larger angles. Then angle beta will also increase and the rays here will go closer and closer to the surface. And there will be some point 
there will be such a ray at such angle alpha critical, critical angle, when the reflected beam will go along the surface. It means that the, uh, the, the refracted beam, it means that no light will go out of this uh, glass plate. All the light will go along the surface. And if we increase just by a little bit the angle of incidence of this light beam from the glass, then all the light will be reflected from the surface and nothing will go out. This phenomenon is called a uh, phenomenon of total internal reflection. Total internal reflection happens when your angle of incidence inside some medium uh, with, uh, uh, with large refractive in index, the re refractive index larger than unity. When, when the light ray goes here at the angles larger than some critical angle, then all the energy will be reflected and no energy will be transmitted to the air from the glass plate. It's easy to calculate the critical angle because we know the, um, the situation, the requirement that sine beta divided by sine alpha in this particular case and equals, uh, equals the uh, refractive index An but if beta equals 90 degrees, that will correspond to the critical, critical angle of incidence of a light ray from, uh, from the glass plate, inside the glass plate. So if beta is 90 degrees, then sine beta is unity. And then this alpha will be equal to critical angle, critical angle <coughs> at which all this... Uh, internal reflection, total internal reflection uh, happens. So this is the condition for, um, for internal reflection, for the critical angle, the condition for the critical angle. And we may say that uh, the sine alpha, if alpha is larger than critical alpha, if alpha is larger than critical alpha, then sine alpha is also larger than critical alpha. So it must be larger or equal than 1 over an for the total internal reflection to be observed. We have to choose such angles alpha for the light ray going from the glass plate uh, to the air. Such angles alpha which are larger than critical alpha. And if critical alpha is defined by this, formula then for any angles alpha larger than critical alpha, sine alpha will be larger than 1 over an from this equation. And that will be the condition for, uh, the condition for total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. So uh, we may increase the angle alpha up to 90 degrees, uh, starting from critical angle up to 90 degrees, and inside all these angles there will be a total internal, inside all these angles of incidence from here, there will be a total internal reflection. Uh, and for this angle the reflection, the reflected light will go this way, and for this angle the reflected light will go along this way, but all the energy will be reflected into the glass and no energy, no light energy will go into the air if, if the condition is this one. And certainly uh, sine alpha must be smaller or equal to unity. It cannot, it can never be larger than a unit. So the second uh, property of light we considered was the reflection and refraction. 
which is described by the, by the Snell's law. And total internal reflection is property number three, which we considered here. And property number four, which I would like to underline, is the dispersion of light. The dispersion of light is the property which consists in the dependence of the refractive index on the frequency of light. The refractive index n, which actually depends on the velocity of propagation of light, actually depends on the frequency or, or the wavelengths of light, because uh, the light of different frequencies has different velocity of propagation in any medium but vacuum. Only in vacuum all the frequencies propagate at the same velocity c, the velocity of light. All the frequencies have the same velocity. But if you go into the medium, then the velocity of propagation will depend on the frequency. And so, therefore, the refraction index will be a function of frequency. If the refraction index is a function of frequency, then what do we have here? The ref refraction index is a function of frequency of the falling electromagnetic radiation, be it a light, or be it a uh, X-ray, X radiation, X-ray beams, or be it a millimeter wave, infrared radiation, any, any type of radiation. If you consider the dependence of refractive index on frequency, you will have some function. It's not constant. It's some function. So what happens if we direct here a beam of light consisting of many, many frequencies, like a white color, like a white beam of light. <clears throat> so this is a white beam of light. The white light is a very peculiar thing. Uh, uh, it seems that the sun radiates the white light and if the light, white light comes uh, to the surface of some medium which has a uh, refractive e index, this is an ordinary medium like a glass, for example, its refractive index will be a function of frequency. And uh, so different frequencies will be refracted at different angles. Some frequencies will go here, other frequencies of light will go in this direction, and other frequencies of light will go in this direction, etc. So the angle of incidence is the same for all frequencies. We have a beam of white light. But different frequencies will have different angles of refraction. Some will have this angle of refraction, others will have this angle of refraction. And it means that at different directions here, we will have different frequencies of light. And uh, this one will be a red, we will perceive this, uh, this ray of light as the red. Then we'll go yellow and green and blue, and then violet, and then violet light, and then ultraviolet goes. And here we will go infrared, which we don't see, we don't see infrared. We can see with our, gla with our eyes infrared radiation, but it is there and it can be detected by special infrared detectors. We don't see it, but it, it's there. So different frequencies will go at different directions and we can observe all these different colors of light. Each color corresponds to each, to different uh, frequencies. Different frequencies correspond to different colors of light. So we have a dispersion of light. Light is dispersed into different colors and this is the principle of work of a prism which uh, separates white light into colors. <clears throat> and the dispersion of light in a prism is well known to you. This is the uh, reason behind Mm, different rainbows and rainbow-like 
uh, colors behind the prism. If you look at the sun through the prism or look at the electric bulb through the prism, you also you will see all different colors from red to blue, from red, from red to blue. And uh, this phenomenon is called a dispersion of light. A dispersion. Sometimes it's very useful if you want to see the spectrum of the original beam of light. If you have some radiation and you want to know the spectrum of radiation, then you need to use some dispersive media. A dispersive medium is the one which, uh, whose refractive index is a function of frequency. If you use such dispersive medium, then you can see the spectrum of the falling light, the frequency spectrum. But sometimes, the, so in this case, if you, if you want to study the uh, spectrum, then this is a very useful phenomenon. But sometimes this phenomenon is not useful, it's harmful. Uh, for example, when you have a lens and you want to observe an image of some object in the lens and you illuminate the object using white light and the lens will give you several images. Uh, you, the lens will give you uh, a blurred image which will have some different colors. It will not be a single uh, distinct image. Uh, it will be a bad image. Uh, distracted by the phenomenon of dispersion. So in this case the dispersion is, uh, is bad and it should be eliminated somehow. And this uh, phenomenon of uh, aberration of lens, <coughs> a color aberration or dispersive aberration, uh, should somehow be dealt with if you want to obtain a good image. <coughs> So, in some cases, this phenomenon is useful and it's used to study spectra, but in other cases, this phenomenon is harmful. It's an obstacle to observing a good image. And so, in some cases, we must, have, we must get rid of this phenomenon. Somehow, we must compensate it. But you must always keep in mind that there is the possibility of dispersion of light if the light has several frequencies in it, the content of frequencies is complicated, then in com with complicated spectrum there will be a dispersion which may be uh, unwanted phenomena in your experiments. Uh, the next thing I would like to consider after property number four, uh, probably we, we will solve some problem better. Better we solve some problem. So the problem will be this one. We have an incident ray of light and it falls on the surface of some dispersive of some refractive media, medium which has a refractive index n. And so there will be some reflected light, some reflected light and some refracted light. And the problem says, what must be the angle of incidence if the reflected light and the refracted light propagate at, at the degree 90, at 90 degrees to one another? Well, my picture is not very good. My picture is not very good because it doesn't show the 90 degree angle, so I will draw it in this way, 
Yes, something like that. The reflected light and the refracted beam propagated 90 degrees to one another. These two, two beams of light are directed at, at the right angle. And the problem asks, what should be the angle of incidence, I1, so that this is realized, this situation is realized, uh, so that the reflected beam propagates at 90 degrees to the refracted beam. So this will be I2. And this angle of reflection certainly equals the angle of incidence. According to the law of reflection, the reflected beam and incident beam go at equal angles, <clears throat> which is not obvious from my picture, but nevertheless, these are two angles are equal. And uh, we must find this angle I sub 1 such that, such that these two beams of light propagate at 90 degrees at, at right angle to each other. So, what do we know about this situation? First of all, certainly we know the Snell's law, which is applicable in this case. So, sine I1 divided by sine I2 equals N. If the refractive index of the upper part is unity. which is the case here. So this light beam comes from vacuum or comes from, from the air and goes into some medium with the refractive index N. This is the first thing we know. And second thing we know that this angle is 90 degrees. How can we describe this angle? Well, this angle is uh, the sum of alpha and beta. So we know that alpha plus beta, these two small angles, is 90 degrees or pi over 2. Alpha equals 90 degrees, which is this angle, pi over 2, the right angle minus I1. And beta equals Again, the right angle minus I2. Uh, this is always true, but in this particular problem, we have a condition imposed on angles alpha and beta. We know that these two beams of, of light propagate at, at right angle. This angle is 90 degrees. This is given in the problem. So if it's given, we add these two equations and obtain alpha plus beta. Alpha plus beta will equal pi minus I1 minus I2. And this alpha plus beta must equal to pi over 2, according to the statement of the problem. So from this equation, we obtain that I1 plus I2, I1 plus I2 equals pi over 2. I1 plus I2 must be equal in sum, uh, after adding these two angles, must be equal to 90 degrees, which is not obvious. It's not directly obvious that this should be so, but we obtained this condition from very simple algebraic uh, conditions imposed on the angles. <clears throat> if this is so, then what is sine, what is uh, sine I2, for example? Sine I2 will be equal to sine the right angle pi over 2 minus I1. And what is a sign of any of uh, the 90 degrees minus any angle? 
that will be a cosine of angle I1 according to geometric uh, the properties of this geometric of this uh, of these functions. <coughs> so sine I2 equals cosine I1. And we use this property here, so this will be sine I1 divided by sine I2, which equals to cosine I1. And what is sine divided by cosine? This is tangent of I1, the same angle. So we obtain the condition, we obtain the solution <coughs> in this problem. The problem question was, what should be the angle of incidence? We have found the angle of incidence should be such that the tangent of angle of incidence equals n, the refractive in index of the second medium here. The refractive index of this medium. If we direct the light beam at such an angle of incidence, the tangent of this angle equals the refractive index of the second medium, then the reflected beam of light will propagate at 90 degrees to the refracted beam of light. This angle will turn out to be uh, 90 degrees. Well, after solving this problem, I would go further with the properties of light. And now, after considering dispersion, dispersion, I would like to consider a simple, such a simple optical device as a lens. So we have a fact or property number five. Uh, interaction of light with lens. What is a lens? Lens is a, such an object which is made of glass or some other transparent material which must be solid and transparent. And usually we use materials with high index of reflection. It must be as high as possible. It must be larger than unity and we use as large in this index of refraction as possible. Because if we use the index of refraction close to unity, then the lens will not work. It will, it will work badly. Uh, if, it's air, if it's filled with air, it will not work at all. So the index of reflection must be the larger the better. And uh, this object, this body, is formed of two spherical surfaces. One spherical surface will have a radius of curvature R1, and another spherical surface will have a radius of curvature R2. So the lens is created, is fabricated in such a way as this, the lens is formed by two spherical surfaces. In general case, they may have different uh, radii of curvature, but sometimes the radii are, are the same. Or sometimes people produce uh, such a lens which has one surface is flat and another surface has some radius of curvature r. Sometimes we have such lenses and sometimes we have this construction of lenses. So this lens is called <coughs> a convex lens. Convex, which means that the surface is convex. And here we have two convex surfaces. So this is double convex lens. <coughs> uh, sometimes people produce lenses with concave surfaces concave surfaces with some radius of curvature. And uh, so
So sometimes lenses are different. Sometimes lenses have one uh, spherical surface, uh, concave surface, and another surface is flat. And sometimes people even produce lenses which have, have one concave surface and another convex surface. So all possible, all possible uh, situations are realized in practice. Uh, what are the properties of such lenses? I will draw a, I will draw a lens which is a concave lens and uh, it's usually uh, people agree to denote the concave lens as such a double arrow. A theory of lens in general cases uh, is a complicated mathematical theory, but the theory turns out to be very simple if we assume that the lens is thin. It's very thin. Its uh, thickness here in this direction is much, much smaller than the diameter of the lens. Of the lens. So we will consider only thin lenses. Each lens has an optical center, and if we draw a line perpendicular to the lens uh, plane, then that will be a principle that is called a principal optical axis. A principal optical axis. <coughs> uh, the lens has this property. If we draw any line which goes through the center of the lens, then the light propagating along this line will not be deflected by the lens. It will go on propagating along the same line, along any direction going through, through the center of the lens, along the principal optical axis or along some auxiliary optical axis. The light will propagate without being deflected or the angle of deflection is zero, it's better to say. Uh, because the lengths are very thin, uh, the light will be somehow shifted sideways, but this is negligible. This effect is negligible because, because it's very thin. We, we consider only thin lenses. Uh, also, there is another property of lens. If we uh, direct a light beam parallel to the principal axis, then the light beam will be deflected somehow and will go in a different direction. But all the light beams parallel to the principal axis will be deflected in such a way that they will go through the same point. And this point is, to, is called a focus. And this length, this distance from the focus to the optical center of the lens this distance is called a focal distance. A focal distance, a focus. This is a focal point and this is a focal distance or simply a focus of the lens. Uh, if we choose to look at the rays, at the light rays going at the edge of the lens, if the light ray goes at the very edge of the lens, then actually this light ray will be deflected and will go somewhat near the focus. Somewhat near the focus. So in order to direct all the light rays into the focus, the lens must not be an ideal spherical surface. But this is a complicated thing and we will not consider this uh, uh, these details and what we what we have to take into account that if the light rays which we consider go closer to the principal axis uh, then all of them will be will be focused into a single point with high degree of precision and uh, the discrepancy in uh, different fo in different points where the light rays are focused will be very small if the light ray goes uh, away from the principal axis, then the point, then its focal point will somewhat shift here. But this is very, 
small effect and we will neglect it. And uh, in the first approximation, which is very good, we may say that all the light rays going in parallel to the, uh, to the axis, to the optical axis, and which all the light rays which are located not far from the optical axis, all of them will be concentrated, will be focused in one point, which is called a focal point. And these light rays which go not far, which are separated not far from the optical axis, from the principal optical axis, all these light rays <coughs> are called paraxial. Paraxial. The word paraxial means that all of them are parallel to the principal optical axis, that is first thing, and second, they go close to the principal axis, with, with this distance not very large, much smaller than the diameter of the lens. We don't consider light rays which are, go, which are the, uh, located at a distance from the optical axis comparable to the radius of the lens. We don't consider such light rays because uh, their propagation is described by a more complicated formula. So as far as the paraxial light rays are concerned, all of them will have one focal point where, the, where all these light rays concentrate and the focus of such a, <coughs> the focus of such a uh, lens may be, may be calculated using the formula n minus 1, where n is the uh, refractive index of the material from which the lens is made, and uh, divided by radius of curvature of one surface of this lens, plus the radius of curvature of the second surface of this lens. If the lens is plane convex, one, one surface is plane and another surface is convex, then the plane surface will have infinite radius of curvature. And infinite radius of curvature will give you zero for the second term here. And uh, then only one radius of curvature will be uh, will be taken into account here. Only one radius of curvature uh, for plane concave lens. Uh, you, can, you can find the derivation of this formula in the Landsberg course of elementary physics. The derivation is not very, uh, is not very complicated. It's simple, but we will not waste our time on this. We will better consider <coughs> for the remaining minutes <coughs> we will consider another important question, which is a lens formula. So, uh, if we have a lens with some principal optical axis, and there is a focus of the lens here, and another focus on the opposite, on the opposite side of the lens, there are, these are two equal uh, distances, the two focus. It it's can be easily proved that the two focal points are located at the same distance from the lens. Then if we take some object here, I will put it like a small arrow, then how do the rays uh, scattered by this object move and how do they propagate in space? The object is illuminated, and so each point of this object is a source of secondary light. And this, the light from this point, for example, goes in all different directions. But we choose only one direction which is convenient for us. We know that any light ray going through the center of the lens goes without deflection, without deflection along the straight line. This is the property of the lens. And also we know that any light ray going parallel to the principal axis will then be deflected to the focus. Will then be deflected to the focus. So this is the focal distance, and this is the same also the focal distance. So this light ray will go in this direction. And when these two rays intersect in space, that will form an image of this point. So the image of other points can, of this object can can be, uh, can be drawn, can be obtained using the same geometrical construction. And so we come to conclusion that there will be an 
image of this object formed in the space. Uh, if this is a true object which is scattering light, then this is not an object. This is an uh, empty space, but just all the rays going from this object through the lens will form here an image because all of them will, uh, will be concentrated. Uh, all the rays from this point will be concentrated in this point and so on. All the rays from this point, for example, in the center of this object will be concentrated and focused in this place. So there will be an image of this object here. If the object has height h, the image will have height c h prime. And if the object is located at a distance a from the lens, then the image will be located at a distance b. And we can immediately write that uh, h divided to h prime equals to a divided by b. Because these triangles here are similar. <coughs> and this angle equals to this angle. So these two right triangles are similar. And h divided by a equals to h prime divided by b. That is the first thing which can be said about this image. And the second thing is that this angle equals to this angle. And therefore, uh, if this is a focal distance, then this section equals to uh, b minus focal distance. And so in this, for these two triangles, this side will also be equal to h. This is also h. And we can say, and we can write down that h divided by f from these two similar triangles, h divided by f equals to h prime divided by this side, which is b, b minus f. And uh, from this equation, h equals h prime a over b. And this expression can be substituted here. So what we have instead of h, we can write h prime a over b and uh, divided by, yes, I, a over b. That was h and divided by f, certainly. Now I take this expression, this formula. I can cancel by h prime. And what will be here in result? bf will be equal to a times b minus f. I cancel by h prime and obtain, and I multiply by bf. bf will go here, and I multiply by, by, by b minus f. It will go here, so a times b minus f, that's correct, and bf is here. After opening the round brackets, I will obtain a b minus a f, and then I will have f times a plus b from here, a times b, a plus b equals a b. And that will lead us to a formula f equal to a b divided by a plus b. Also, this formula is often written in such a form that 1 over f will equal to 1 over a plus 1 over b. This is the lens formula which connects the focal distance of a thin lens and a the distance of the object from the lens and b which is the distance from the image of our object from the lens. Uh, the distance of object and the distance of its image from the center of the lens are connected with the focal distance of the lens. Uh, now it's the end of this lecture and we will continue discussing all these sort of problems next time on 